Uh, hi, this is Mike Sherma uh, from the National Weather Service Meteorological Development Laboratory. Um, with me remotely are uh, uh, Marina and uh, Jenna Myers, Marina Tomafeyeva and Jenna Myers. Uh, Marina's logging on uh, momentarily. Um, so uh, a couple of uh, things um, to just for, for bookkeep bookkeeping. Um, we are going to record this uh, session. Um, and uh, once I know a, uh, a the host of you know where, where the URL is going to be where I, where I, where I want to you know put the the file, then I'll I'll email out uh, to the uh, appropriate uh, venues, um, you know, so everybody knows where to find this for those who want to watch it again or missed it. Um, right now, uh, the attendees here are in uh, listen only mode, uh, but uh, if you have a question or a comment. Uh, either um, uh, type it in the text box and we'll see it in the, the, the go to webinar text box um, and we'll see it. Um, or um, use the raise your hand feature. You can see a little hand on the, the right hand side of the, in, in the, uh, the go to webinar, the webinar interface. Excuse me. And, um, and then if you raise your hand, we'll be able to, to see that as well. So. Uh, yeah, either way, to, just to get our attention, and, and uh, we can we can correspond. Um, so, okay, with that, let's see if I can scroll forward here. Okay, so we're going to have a, a rough agenda talking about uh, LCAT uh, review, um, what it can do uh, for those either who have used it uh, a long time ago um, or have never used it. Its current capabilities and data sets. Um, then for those of you who, who uh, have used it or, or those who are about to uh, talk about the inclusion of the CFSR Arctic sea ice parameters and where we, um, what we learned from the exercise of including uh, that data set and how we wanted to change LCAT uh, to incorporate more uh, data sets and capabilities and, um, and sort of segging the way to the next initiative, which is coastal parameters. And then I'll finally wrap up with just a brief look at, at using uh, the virtual lab as an LCAT uh, resource. So what is LCAT? Uh, where is LCAT? Here we go. Um, so uh, that's the URL uh, for those who haven't uh, been there before. Um, and uh, it's an online tool. Uh, that was introduced uh, about six years ago. Uh, that enables studies of climate change impacts at the local level and provides access to local and regional data analysis methods recommended by NOAA subject matter experts for application at the local level. And I look at this slide and it's a brief slide, um, but I count the word local uh, like one, two, three, four times, um, let alone for the L and LCAT, and uh, just sort of, you know, driving home the idea that this is for the examination of data sets at, at the very local level, uh, you know, climate divisions, uh, stations, um, and that that's really where, where LCAT uh, provides the, the you know, its its best, uh, you know, its, its most value. Um, now, a lot of, uh, uh, well, I guess most um, most of, of LCAT is geared toward the Weather Service. It, the primary user of, the, of LCAT is the National Weather Service, in particular, uh, forecast offices. Um, but there can there can be other users, uh, uh, also in NOAA, outside of NOAA, in the government, even in the private sector and in universities. Um, having said that, you know, we are concerned with uh, fulfilling our strategic goals for the Weather Service, and you can see the different things here in these bullet points. Um, uh, as, as far as uh, what LCAT can do. And, and just to, to note the last bullet point, uh, the different applications that LCAT can have in the different service areas, uh, winter weather, water resources, fire weather, heat. Um, we, we think that LCAT can, can, can help uh, the weather service uh, you know, with those, those issues. And uh, just to, to, as a follow-up to the strategic goals, here are two quotes, uh, one from the uh, Weather Nation Roadmap and one from the Weather Act that we think are applicable. So um, examples of LCAT capabilities. On the left, you uh, 
you may find um, questions that either you ask or maybe a, a member of the public calls up the Weather Service Forecast Office and asks you, um, and uh, how is the temperature changing in my town? Uh, things about uh, local regional droughts. Um, and so LCAD is uh, hopefully going to help answer those type of questions uh, with um, you know, getting the, the data sets uh, uh, that, that are necessary and performing um, proper scientific techniques on them to provide the answers. And there's some of the, the, uh, uh, the, the data and data analyses on the right-hand side that we either are providing or intend to provide. Current features, here are some of the output that you can um, generate with uh, the local climate analysis tool. And uh, we're gonna be looking at a little bit more at, at that uh, coming up. So data sets, uh, starting um, four main data sets right now, starting with the NCI climate division data. Uh, now we have 344 state-based climate divisions from NC, uh, NCDC slash NCEI uh, with 13 Alaska climate divisions on the way. Um, monthly data since, data since 1895. Now all the, we have all the parameters that you see there. Um, I want to draw attention, especially to the drought parameters towards the bottom, the Palmer uh, hydrological drought index, the, the Z index, drought severity index modified drought severity index. We found during a recent user study that a lot of our users didn't even know that the drought parameters were there. So we just uh, wanted to uh, bring that to uh, the attention of, of this group. Um, we will ingest uh, monthly data from NCEI uh, using a cron job uh, once a month. And so that's where the data is coming from and again updated monthly. So uh, here in, in the background, you can see a little bit of uh, uh, larger zones, uh, 102 climate prediction center climate forecast regions derived from and, and amalgamated from the, the previous NCI climate divisions, uh, also data since 1895 where we have average temperature and total precipitation. Uh, we get this data from the climate prediction system, excuse me, climate prediction center, uh, again, once a month uh, using a cron job. GHCN uh, homogenized data uh, since 1925, uh, the average temperature, max temperature, min and total precipitation, also uh, monthly from uh, NCEI. And then we have the ACES data with these monthly extreme uh, parameters. Uh, this is not homogenized raw data. And um, for those of you on the call who use XMASIS, uh, this would be the same uh, stations. So given those data sets, there are different operations that LCAT can perform uh, on, on them. Uh, general time series, and then um, uh, different ways to fit, uh, uh, do fittings for the time series, uh, hinge, optimal climate normal, uh, e EMWA, um, different analysis types, ensemble rate of change, uh, D-trend. And you can see on the top right, a time series, and on the bottom right, a, a histogram. Um, word that will demonstrate uh, in the actual LCAT. Climate variability analyses um, uh, using different uh, uh, signal indices um, and phases and thresholds, analysis types, uh, local composites, departures from normal box plots. And this was Actually, I find this, reading this, uh, even though I made this slide and I work in LCAT, there's a lot here. And so uh, I think um, it's easier to demonstrate. And hopefully that gives a little more context. And so let me find my window here. Excuse the mess. So I'm logged into LCAT, and um, if you're not logged, if you haven't logged into LCAT ever, um, you'll go to this uh, page and you'll find a, a register button, which you can, uh, which with which you can register an account for LCAT. Now, generally we use our our NOAA emails as our usernames, um, 
but we do not at this time use uh, LDAP authentication for this. You need a separate password. Uh, that can change and uh, we intend to change that in the future. Um, but for now, you need a separate password. So you'd log in and you have uh, these different tabs. And I wanna mention right off the bat, uh, the learn section. Whoops, see now I have to log in because uh, I uh, spent too much time uh, talking about LCAT. So. so username and a separate password. And here's the register if you haven't ever logged in. So let's see if I forgot my password. Okay, this is just a uh, user on my part. There we go. There we go, logged in. So I wanna mention a, a lot of the great training modules uh, that were provided early on by uh, folks like Nicole McGavick, who uh, I think is on the uh, webinar today, um, Jenna Myers, uh, Clinton Rocky, uh, Barbara Mays Boosted. Uh, there's a lot of information that LCAT uh, can convey, uh, but you, you really have to, to um, sort of you know, get into the detail sometimes if you want to make maximum use of it. I find that I watch these uh, intermittently uh, just to remind myself uh, uh, you know, so I can in, in, interpret the LCAT data uh, as best I can successfully. So I'm going to go to the main tab, which is here, LCAT. And so right now you see climate impacts and correlation studies. Uh, at the moment, we're not doing anything with correlation studies tab. So the main tab is climate impacts. And if you look at this menu, uh, first I uh, want to mention the under the data section, it's going to have a description of the data sets uh, that uh, I mentioned before, homogenized sedation data, CPC forecast region data, inside climate division data, and ACES data. And so I find that very helpful. Um, and so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to select a data set. Now, you'll note that uh, among the four data sets, uh, the variables will change depending on the data set you choose. So if I choose NCI, I get all these parameters, which I wouldn't with, uh, say, the 52J GHCN data. So if I choose climate divisions as a data set, for example, um, I can either choose one by typing it in and having it autofill. Or, and this goes for any, any of the data sets, I can select a reference map. And here come my uh, NCEI climate divisions. And I will choose, for the heck of it, main. Let's go up here, use this location. So there it is. Um, time periods, uh, you can go from monthly to different uh, levels of season average up to nine months or annual. Um, and note here, uh, the latest data we have in LCAT right now, is September, um, there's a, 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 a lag with getting data from NCI where, you know, some of the data is, is homogenized and, 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 and created in, in files that we can, um, decode. And so, uh, we always are, are at the end of, you know, the current month getting the previous month's data. So if by next week or so, we'll have, uh, the October data here for 2019. For now, we have the, the latest being September. Um, so I'm going to ask for monthly data uh, from Janu January, from 1925 to 2019. And I'm going to ask for just about everything I can here, um, these different trends. And again, here, here's a pop-up that'll help uh, uh, you interpret which trends you may want. Ensemble, rate of change, the trend. Climate variability analyses, I, I mentioned just briefly before. And so I wanted to ask for all these different plots, um, two category, climatology reference. Um, and so if we're looking at distributions saying the, the, uh, the region is, uh, is warmer than normal, well, it's warmer than normal compared to what? 
uh, and so that's where the climatology reference comes in. Um, it's sort of like something, a, a comparison reference. So I make all these selections and I select analyze. And I've asked it for a lot, so it may take a few seconds, but it'll get there. Here we go. OK, so we have uh, several graphs here. And, um, and this, is a, this, this one is the time series with these different uh, uh, trend fittings. And one thing I want to mention right off the bat is all that comes with this. Um, you have an interpretation statement that for every, the, every one of the graphs. And so you can see here. Uh, it helps you interpret what's going on with the the the, uh, the different fittings and the um, uh, uh, information that 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 Elka came up with. So so it again helps off with with the, the interpretation of the graph. Um, down here, you have uh, uh, some of the statistics that that uh, were generated. And you have uh, the a lot of the data, just the the data that came up from the data files, um, both uh, the general uh, um, time series trend and the hinge data, and and uh, the OCN eleven and fifteen years ensemble rates. All these all these data you can grab um, if you want. Uh, they're there. Um, you can go way up here and and download all of the images we're about to show um, in, a, in a zip file. Uh, you can uh, download the data to a CSV file. Uh, so there's a lot here that you can do. Uh, you don't have to necessarily use this, this LCAT uh, graph if you don't want to, but, you, but it's there if you want it. Um, and so uh, just to roll through, so here here are the three, excuse me, I guess four different uh, uh, fittings um, or five, a D-trend, or that's an analysis type. Um, so uh, Marina, do you want to talk about the individual uh, um, trend fits here? Or I can just, just discuss them very briefly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, if you want, to, I can do it. Um, How it will yeah. fit best, best to your presentation. Yeah, see, please go ahead. Just, yeah, yeah. Okay, now uh, we are using like several trends here, and uh, one is this distinct trend uh, change, uh, which allows us to look at the change of uh, climate change in the current data. So if you want to track uh, current changes at the station data, uh, this is the best one uh, to use. And uh, three variations of different optimal climate normals and optimal climate normals climate normals are 30 years averages and optimal climate normals are based on 15 or 10 on the or 11 years and in the brackets for each of them is given uh, the uh, averaging period so if you want to track how climate normals are changing this is uh, the best options for you and sometimes you want just to look at the climate change as overall so you can select all of them and in this case you can look uh, select ensemble of all of them or few of them and look at the tr uh, rate of change based on all climate normals altogether thank you mike back thank to you. you thank you um Okay, and so we also have, and, 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 and either Jenna or Marina, if you want to add anything, because uh, I'm just going to roll through these, these images, um, anything you want to mention about the, the output here, please do. Um, so we have, a, we have a histogram to show, uh, showing the normality of, of uh, um, the data set, this, the skewness, uh, the lean, and the kurtosis, the, the spread. Um, and we have uh, the ensemble where we're averaging together the different uh, a trend fits that we saw in the, in the two slides ago. And a rate of change, uh, a straight uh, straight line axis rate of change. 
and the probability distributions um, for average temperature. And I mentioned before the climate reference period. So uh, you know this is based on you know com comparing um, comparing the probability distribution for January for this for this uh, climate division um, above or below against the, the 1981 to 2010 reference period. And you can choose earlier cli climate reference periods. This is a very good option just to see uh, what are the uh, distribution between the different categories as you defined. Uh, and in this case, it is two categories, below and above average uh, temperature. And you can see here that in the records, we have more chance to be in above normal because uh, some more data in this period were located beyond uh, climate climatological reference period, like nine years after. So this is just definitely a representative of this example. Okay, and here's the AO, um, primer, the probability distributions. Um, and uh, you need to keep the previous picture always in mind how it is uh, for the full record uh, is distributed. So we remember that it was greater chance to be in above normal, but look at this distribution, there is much greater chance for when AO is acting, there is much greater chance that it would be above normally distributed variable. But when I see this kind of things, there is no uh, borderline, uh, like a solid borderline uh, bar uh, that is indicating that this is a statistically significant chance. We are computing 10% uh, level statistical significance. In this case, we allow ourselves to be wrong 10% of the time when we are making the conclusion about relationship between um, the category of the distribution and its relationship to um, climate variability index, um, the Arctic constellation in this case. So in this case, um, example, we know the probabilities, but they are within 90% uh, confidence that there is no relationship uh, between, um, between uh, each of these categories and Arctic oscillation. But it is not always the case. Thank you. Yeah, and as Marina mentioned, if, if we do have that 90%, um, reach that 90% threshold, uh, the the uh, the bar will have a nice uh, uh, black outline around it. So, and then box plots uh, uh, showing, um, I guess, the, the standard deviations uh, away from away from the mean here. One and two standard deviations. This is another good way to look at the relationship. Uh, and we can see that the mean is slightly greater uh, during Arctic oscillation uh, in positive mode than is in negative mode. But they are very close. It's another indicator for you probably to uh, that there is no relationship, no significant relationship. Because you know once you will find the example where there is a big difference in the samples during uh, negative or and positive Arctic oscillation, you will see that the, the means would be significantly different from each other. And the spread of the box plot shows the variability. And you can see that variability is slightly less in, during positive Arctic oscillation. But um, they are very compatible. OK, thank you again. Thank you again. Um, so uh, you can, in addition to saving just the output of these graphs um, the, the, in the CSV files and PDFs and the imagery, you can actually save the settings of the report uh, so that you can, uh, uh, when you log in, you can, you can um, remember where you know, everything is selected and it, and it would rerun the report for you. Um, and so that's, you know, LCAT as it stands right now, I, well, I should mention that, that we, uh, LCAT will not let you, uh, go uh, below 30 years, um, or it shouldn't. Let me see if I can uh, very quickly uh, 
make it rebel here. So it, so it wants to have 30 years to have a nice uh, climatological reference set. Here we go. Um, so at the, yeah, 30 years at the least for all these studies. So. Yeah, 30 years is um, based on statistical reasoning because we need to have at least 30 years of records to have a robust estimate of statistics. And what is good about LCAT and Mike, can you scroll down the, sc uh, the output screen? The all statistics and all data you can see here. It gives uh, the data and you can click on each input and just download if you want. Uh, and it gives to you all the years with positive answer, um, uh, excuse me, not answer, AO. Uh, and um, it gives all statistics and all data for you. And it gives also rate of change. Uh, and you can see that uh, the rate of change in this case is uh, about one degree per 30 years. It is also a very small one. It's another reason to look at this spatially in different places because uh, climate change brings its different toll in different areas. There is a big uh, spatial variability in climate change and seasonal variability in climate change. Different seasons will have a different signature in, of climate change. Okay, so before I go back to the uh, slide presentation, are there any questions um, regarding uh, LCAT uh, in its in its current state, uh, as we see here, um, for myself, Jenner, and Marina? Again, either put put a question in the chat box or uh, raise your hand, and I'll see it and, and unmute you. Okay, so I'm going to uh, return to the slide presentation here and from current slide. And uh, some of the next slides are, are, are a little bit of uh, uh, re recruitment for uh, various uh, science advisory teams. Um, when we um, are looking at, at uh, LCAT, uh, development, um, either for the original LCAT, as we just saw, or, or new initiatives that are underway. Um, science advisory teams are, are, are stood up for, for, for subject matter experts to advise us on uh, requirements and best practices. And so um, those, uh, um, that, that type of, of effort is mostly uh, coordinated by Marina and Jenna and, and uh, uh, Fiona in, in the climate services branch um, of AFSO, but then they will, will um, work, uh, you know, work with 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 the different agencies and in, in, in among really mostly NOAA, but also again the private industry and, and, and maybe universities, uh, and help help uh, National Weather Service OSTI MDL, which is uh, uh, myself and my colleague uh, Mike Coleman, uh, to uh, work through the requirements and start development. Um, now, now, this particular slide was uh, uh, created for the the Arctic initiative um, that we're going to talk about mostly so or shortly. But uh, here's where I have like AR for Alaska region, but but really for for uh, the different uh, types of things what we want to look at and improve for LCAT. It can be anyone in any region and uh, any WFO. Anyone on the the webinar right now, I think, would want to hear uh, your feedback. So. Um, requirements for LCAT Arctic studies. Um, we uh, started off with some just some some vague things we wanted to accomplish uh, to, to include more more uh, so-called Arctic parameters, and, and we focused in mostly on sea ice from the climate forecast system reanalysis and and climate forecast system version two and parameters that were related to sea ice, um, like uh, uh, salinity and and potential temperature uh, in the water. Um, and so uh, that was the primary effort for what we call LCAT Arctic or LCAT sea ice. Uh, that's the first big new development uh, since uh, LCAT uh, uh, was stood up uh, in, in 2013. And so uh, um, uh, we had 
planned a demonstration, a full demonstration of LCAT Arctic capabilities on our test platform. Uh, but uh, it's uh, been a, a, a unusual tough day uh, uh, for the, the the server, the folks um, where we get the data from and uh, at NCI. And so we're not able to connect to the server to do a, to do a full demo. But Jenna uh, can show a lot of what the uh, LCAT, the, the updated LCAT uh, will look like uh, in the next uh, couple months once we roll it out to production. Uh, so Jenna, I'm going to give you presentation. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, just give me presentation mode and then I will take over. Yep. You have the helm. My screen. What am I showing? Can you see it? Yes. Is it the two screen or one screen? It's, uh, it looks like one screen, it looks good. Okay, all right. Um, so you can see the dev site here? Yes. Okay, all right, well, like Mike said, um, unfortunately today of all days, the um, server that the data reside on at NCEI is either down or something happened. Um, so it's not live, it's not working right now, but I can at least show you some of the options um, on the left-hand menu that are going to be um, with the new capabilities when we roll out, um, I guess, in early 2020. Um, so, what, did you want to say something, Mike? Well, I mean, it, it, as, as soon as we can, after we get some small things all worked out, you know, hopefully, uh, yeah, if it, hopefully uh, this year. Yeah, hopefully. Um, so I just wanted to mention real quick that the new data set um, is the CFSR CFS2. So it's the climate forecast system. Um, like Mike showed you in the um, original LCAT, the help button, um, you can select that and scroll down for more information on the actual data set that is utilized. I believe, oh, here it is. So it's a fully coupled um, model representing the interaction with the Earth's atmosphere, ocean, land, and, ocean, and sea ice. Um, we have two different versions. Version two came online in March 2011, and then we used the CFSR um, from 1979 through that date. So we basically have the total um, data are from 1979 through the present. Um, and you can read more once this comes alive. We can read more about the actual data set here. Um, it's all laid out. Uh, and then also about a few of the issues that we've noted um, that are well-known issues of CFSR, uh, CFS2, sea ice, the sea, specifically the sea ice thickness or the ice cover thickness um, variable. I won't go too much into detail about it, but um, we will have the information in here as well as some pop-up messages that will arrive when you select that um, variable. So, and then lastly, I'll just mention, we also will have a training module on the learn section. So Mike showed you the learn section in the beginning. Um, it's conducted by yours truly, and it will be available once we um, have the uh, Arctic implemented. Um, so now back to our options, the, in the variable um, slot for the CSFR CFS2 data set, we now have five new variables, air temperature, ice cover proportion, ice cover thickness, salinity, and water potential temperature. Um, for each of those, there is a different, there's four different cycle um, selections that you, the different runs that you can select. Um, I, we always, whenever I do examples, I just select all and that gives the average of them. Um, let's see. So I believe I just wanted to show you real quickly for salinity and also water potential temperature, there is another option here, the depth. Um, each of these, options goes from five meters all the way down to almost 20 or 4,500 meters deep depth. Um, next up is the location. It's a little bit different than what Mike showed you. Um, there are now, since it's a gridded data set, there are two options that you can select your area of interest. You can either do a bounding box by selecting a box using your um, mouse, or you can select a station using uh, your mouse as well, and it'll just select a point. Uh, let's see if I can select that, and it'll populate here. Or I guess if you know your lat longs, you can just um, populate them by hand here. And then I believe the rest of it is all the same. Um, all the options that Mike showed you are um, exactly the same. It might, the only difference is the time period only goes back to 1979. 
Um, and as of right now, it says it shows 2018, but the, they're working on that issue as well. That's another NCI uh, server issue, but that will be um, fixed by the time this is implemented as well. Um, is there anything else do you think I should show? Oh, you wanted to see the um, the new climate divisions, right, Mike? Yeah, please, please. Uh, so, so yeah, select uh, just by reference map. Oh, the map. Yeah. So the the climate divisions for Alaska are now populated in this version. So whenever this version gets implemented, they will be here now. Um, I believe that is it. So unfortunately, I don't think I can show you the actual run. I think it still comes up as an error. So what I'll do is I'll, I populated a um, PowerPoint very quickly to show you some examples that I, um, oops, this is weird. What are you seeing right now? Uh, I haven't two, done this. Two, two slides. Uh, hold on. I might just make it bigger like this because I don't know how to lay out do the yeah that's actually fine. the time thing. Okay, I just don't know how to get rid of that timer thing right now. Okay, so these are just a couple examples that I have from um, the, actually the training that will be produced for the Arctic when it rolls out um, in early 2020. And I just want to show you the location that I selected for the ice cover thickness. Um, and here are some of the plots that we get, um, the time series analysis for sea ice thickness uh, in October. And this is an average of the points within the bounding box. So I showed you the location. So basically it averages all of the data points within that box. Uh, you can see the ice cover thickness on the left hand um, menu, the left-hand side, and then time across the bottom. And you can see there's a significant decrease here in the month of October. Uh, there's three, I selected three different trend methods here, the estimated weighted moving average, the OCN for 11 year and 15 year as well. Um, they're all very similar trend fitting techniques, however, with slightly different methods for weighting and averaging. Um, you can see larger fluctuations in the data set and how they affect uh, the different um, the te the trend techniques in different ways. Um, I I think the the best one on this one is probably well they're all they're all very similar um, on this example. Um, let's see. And then also I just put the histogram down here just for reference. Um, basically, whenever you run any analysis on the new Arctic data sets, it does the same options um, as your old ones. So you'll still get the time series plot, the histogram. Um, and the rate of change on all those different um, plots. So just a real quick example to show you the different, the ensemble um, of the different trends here. Um, again, Mike kind of went over that in the last one. This is for ice cover thickness again for October. Uh, let's move on, the rate of change. Um, and I believe I wrote down the actual rate of change here. Uh, yeah, it's like a little a little over a third of a meter over the course of 30 years um, rate of change. So the rate of change actually helps you answer questions of how fast the climate variability or climate variable is changing over time. So is it this sea ice thickness increasing or decreasing over time? What is the rate it's, it's um, changing? Um, next up, um, I'll show you really quickly some examples from temperature. And this is the location I utilized um, in the Bering Sea, just north of the St. Lawrence Island. Um, you can see here the air temperature. I also selected October. October is a good month for some reason in the Arctic. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, studies on why, but maybe it's you know the fall going into the cooler season. Um, this is a, a swing area or swing time of um, the year. Um, here we show the time series plot and you can see there's a slight increase. I believe I wrote it down. Oh yeah, it's 1.86 degrees um, Fahrenheit increase over the last 30 years. So that's also a pretty um, significant um, increase in temperature. And I also plotted the histogram here as well for you guys to look at. Uh, let's see. Oh, I also ran the composite analysis uh, against the Arctic oscillation for air temperature. And you know, here, um, I have the detrended, no, sorry, the non-detrended data on the left, and then also the detrended data on the right. Um, we can see that the highest tercile uh, above is above normal for each of the different phases of the Arctic Oscillation. And um, as you can see on the right-hand side, where when we utilize the detrended data, it doesn't show much of a change. 
um, except for the fact that maybe a couple of the uh, bars are not bolded anymore, so they're not statistically significant. Um, and this just goes to show you that it's consistent with saying that the trend here is so strong that it's masking any signal or impact that the Arctic Oscillation would have on air temperature in this region. Okay, so moving on to the box plot, and Marina had gone over kind of like what the um, interpretation of the box plot is on the last um, example you showed, Mike. Um, here again, it just shows in the positive phase of the Arctic, there's less variability, um, less spread in the range of values than it is during a negative phase. And also the average is slightly um, lower, um, but again, it's not too significantly um, different. Uh, let's see, moving on. And then I just really quickly, my last two slides here, I just wanted to show you really quickly the other two um, variables, although I might have skipped one. I think I skipped ice cover proportion, so I didn't have time to throw that one in here. But um, here's salinity, and I, I did a composite analysis for El Nino or Oni. Um, you can see during the El Ninos, there's a greater chance for above normal salinity, and then um, and that's statistically significant there. And that's um, lo the location I selected was um, up here in the Bering Strait area. And then water potential temperature, this is the last one I have, I think. I think, yeah, that is. Whoops. Um, I just plotted the water potential temperature down here in the Bering Sea. It's also, there's an also um, an increased trend in that. And, and I also did a composite with the Pacific North American pattern. And you can see during the positive phases or the high PNA um, mode, there's a greater chance for above normal um, WPT and in the negative phase, there or the low phase of the PNA, there's a greater chance for below normal WPT. So I believe that's that was those were the only examples I was able to pull together. I'm sorry we weren't able to show you um, actual live demo. Um, hopefully it'll be fixed very soon. Um, is there anything else, or Marina, did you did you want to add anything else to the Arctic um, uh, yeah, capabilities I just wanted discussion? To say that uh, yes, I just wanted to say that Arctic capabilities is good news for everyone. It is not <laughs> only for people in Alaska, because uh, first of all, it is a new data set that we uh, that has a lot of capabilities. Uh, CFS, CFSR and CFS version two is global data set, so it is available everywhere. We are going to build on this uh, for many, um, many more variables in the coastal capabilities that will be coming uh, next year, and um, maybe um, extreme capabilities that will be coming the following year. There is a lot of data sets in the atmosphere and in the depths of the ocean. So now we extended this to the depths of the ocean, and I'm sure that people in the Pacific region would be very much interested to look at the sea surface temperature and salinity and its variation and relationship to ENSO, for example. So there is uh, good news for everyone. This is what I wanted to add. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Jenna, very much, um, and thank you, Marina, as well. Um, so uh, we have a question from Annette Hollingshead, who is one of the original developers of LCAT. Um, and uh, the question is, will the new data sets include dynamic interpretation statements as well? Um, the answer is yes, but sort of minimally. Um, we, we ended up just changing the, because we're using the, the original LCAT and, and leveraging um, uh, you know that that architecture. We didn't add full new, you know, full new uh, text, um, uh, you know, to to that architecture. We just you know changed as little, you know, changed again minimally. So maybe text that that uh, would have uh, read as uh, drier uh, for one parameter now reads uh, less salty or 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 salty or something like that for 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 like a salinity parameter. So the answer is is yes. We we do have dynamic interpretation statements for the new parameters, but they're, they, they, you know, but besides the, the, the units and the, the actual parameter name, they haven't changed much from the, the old parameters. So, and that I have you unmuted if you wanted to discuss any further. No, thank you. That answers my question. Okay, great. Um, okay. So, um, going to go back to the, 
uh, presentation, and I'm going to retake, if I can, Jenna, the... Uh, yeah, um, sure. Do, do I have to do it or you do it? Uh, make presenter uh, me. Let's see if I can do it. Show okay. me screen. Yeah, you did it. Okay. Um, okay, so... And again, forgive my uh, mess here. Um, so, uh, as we we implemented the Arctic capabilities, um, there were a lot of motivations to to uh, look at at LCAT and, and see if we could uh, Im improve it and, and change it as necessary going into the future. Um, we found um, from a user a lot of ideas from user feedback analysis in 2015. And the usability study that I mentioned briefly uh, before in 2019, we're, we're looking at how you know, ways to highlight the drought parameters more than we have. Um, uh, in addition, um, the, the, as I mentioned, the, the Arctic capabilities, uh, um, when we, we implemented them in the current Elkhart architecture, there were, um, there, the way we had to do that you know, led to suggest that we might want to try a different approach with our, our back end design so we could really open up the architecture to, to, to new CFS data sets and other data sets um, as well. Um, and then um, we had, uh, in terms of technological advances, uh, we've, we've uh, considered a, a more, uh, I guess, contemporary user interface, uh, things that, that uh, I would call modernized, but I'll call contemporary. Um, that, that make LCAT more resemble some of the uh, the map-driven uh, applications that 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 are comparable to it uh, in you know in in general and in the weather service as well. Uh, and we've been helped out uh, because we've been using an MDL, a commercial cloud hosting of a test platform, uh, for a while. We didn't have a a secondary platform at all for LCAT uh, for that we could really test and prototype on beyond our own personal uh, development areas, and that uh, inhibited uh, development and, and inhibited you know testing and for and bug fixing too. Um, uh, but now we have that capability um, with the commercial cloud we're using, and so we can we can you know look a little more, little further ahead. Um, so uh, this uh, interface. A prototype is what we showed to a user group uh, in the uh, uh, CPASW uh, uh, conference in Charleston this year, and that was part of the uh, the drought uh, uh, user user study um, that was underway. And uh, so again, just a, the, an early look at a, at a prototype. A lot of you know things have to be decided as far as what you know LCAT will look like in the end, but but. Uh, um, something, you know, something to this effect, it, it kind of resembles some, some again, other, other interfaces and even a Google map to some degree um, uh, compared to what, what LCAT looks like right now. And it, 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 we can do th things that can highlight, again, I, as I mentioned, the draw parameters and other parameters that may have been hidden otherwise, and make it a, a, a very familiar uh, user experience. And uh, all while um, kind of streamlining the code, uh, both front end and back end. Um, so, uh, we mentioned coastal needs before. Um, the next big initiative, uh, once we, after we've rolled out the Arctic um, uh, capabilities, is uh, what we call coastal. And, you know, these are just general needs uh, that we're hoping to lead to specific requirements, and, that are, and these have been mentioned to us. Uh, um, you know, the ocean water related uh, um, data here is uh, uh, tide gauge data, sea level rise. I'm uh, almost certain we'll have some sort of tide gauge data in in LCAT in, in you know the next iter big iteration um, after Arctic uh, in a year or so. Um, and you know, all going down to water turbidity. Um, for these are, are weather and wind needs, and you know, they're they're thought of as coastal needs. But they can be uh, where, wherever your WFO is or wherever your your uh, your your interest uh, is. Uh, uh, you know, for the weather service mission, um, uh, you know, weather and wind, uh, you know, might have uh, application for for your you know for your needs uh, in LCAT. Um, and so, uh, as I go forward and, and ask for you know feedback for requirements and, and ideas uh, uh, for coastal, uh, you don't have to be uh, sitting on a coast or a coastal WFO to uh, think of a, an LCAT need uh, that we can call coastal, but can be have general application. Um, 
So the, as we mentioned before, this is a bit of a recruiting uh, session as well as, a, as, a, as an informational session. Um, the IWT uh, integrated working team, including uh, Marina and Jenna and myself, AFSO and MDL, are looking for uh, ideas and looking for uh, people who are interested in being in science advisory teams. Um, we have a function account in VLAB called lcat.coastal.vlab at noaa.gov. Uh, um, and you can email that um, account and it'll show up in VLAB. And we have a VLAB uh, community um, uh, dedicated to LCAT. Now this is right here, you're seeing a public page. Uh, but if um, uh, one wants to join the LCAT community uh, and you're a member of VLAB, you can. And I'll just uh, very quickly, if I can, amongst all the pages I have uh, up. Single sign on, go in um, and uh, find the community LCAT. And um, here's the here's the the public page, and anyone can see without login. You go to the private pages, and you can see we have a, a forum that with that LCAT uh, uh, VLAB um, Coastal VLAB uh, uh, email that you can subscribe to, almost like a listserv. We have document libraries. Um, they have old posters and presentations, and so I'm trying to turn this into like a good resource, uh, um, you know, for for. Uh, uh, LCAT information. So I see a question here. Um, okay. Yeah, from Mike, I was actually going to help out with that one. I just um, looked it up. Um, Daniel asked if how long it takes to get approval to access the LCAT um, site. And usually within like a day or two, you know, whenever one of us sees it come, sees it come through. But I just checked um, your account, Daniel, and it looks like you last logged in on um, 2015. So you just have to either remember your <laughs> password, or if um, if you need help, just send me an email, Jenna.Myers at no.gov, and I will help uh, reset your password. And uh, the comment here also that with um, uh, transition to uh, the cloud that Mike um, just mentioned now about new interface, uh, this um, time would be almost instant. Yeah, the yeah, future, the future one. Yeah, in 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 the future, we're going to have more alignment with with LDAP, you know. So for for at least for for internal end of uh, users, um, or or another Google account, um, or another account of some sort. So, um, but yeah, we 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 respond pretty quickly, and um, uh, again, uh, it, it's not just weather service people can use this. It's 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 people in 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 the private sector and universities. Um, you know, we we. You know, we'll we'll do a little vetting as we see information as we see users come in and make sure they're you know they're um, you're part of the climate community basically. Um, so let's see here. Back to the last couple slides. Uh, from current slide. So a rough timeline. Um, so we're just again trying to finish up uh, the Elkhead Arctic to get it ready for production. Um, and as we're doing that, we're we're getting requirements together for coastal capabilities. Again, if you have ideas, uh, please let us know. Um, and then uh, on the heels of that, we're, we have a, another initiative, uh, the weather extremes. Um, uh, and and that a lot of that is going to be uh, um, more uh, inclusion of ACES data into LCAP, but not, but not, but not exclusively. Um, and uh, so we'll be looking for, for, for information and requirements on, on that as well. And then you know, I kind of a, a, a black and blue uh, kind of vague color scheme here. The, the two initiatives are, are will be, be going uh, a little bit back to back. Uh, but the coastal will be implemented first in you know at the end of uh, towards the tail end of 2020 if all goes well. And this would be actually a good question to Annette. Uh, maybe you can advise to us uh, on what NCI data set in extremes uh, we can uh, leverage for LCAT. Oh, and that you're muted, so if you, and yourself muted, so if you could unmute if you wanted to respond to Marina. Um, 
the, I, I just finished the question. Uh, so it is either back to you or uh, Annette, if she has uh, something to comment. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, my mind is completely racing now with all sorts of ideas. So we should definitely talk offline about some some um, opportunities with NCI. I, I'm very welcome to this. Thank you. Okay, and so here are the, the you know, primary links. Um, so there's LCAT, uh, there's the, the, the VLAB uh, community for LCAT. Uh, contact uh, Marina if you have uh, uh, specific questions about LCAT or, or uh, uh, jenna.myers at noaa.gov as, as uh, uh, you know, in Noah's case uh, for help uh, for emails, um, or excuse me, for, for, for uh, credential. Um, I'm uh, Michael Cherma at NOAA.gov, and uh, the LCAT, uh, Coast, LCAT Coastal Forum is uh, lcat.coastal.vlab.noaa.gov, uh, and these are all ways that you can reach us, and in, in the latter, latter case, be part of a, a larger discussion as far as LCAT capabilities in the future. Um, are there any questions, further questions from the audience? Either uh, type them or raise your hand. Okay, um, Marina or Jenna, do you want to add anything? Uh, I'm good at this time, so uh, please use LCAT, uh, I guess, um, and let us know what uh, would help you to make a better use of LCAT, especially in decision support services. Thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you, uh, Jenna and Marina, very much. and. Uh, um, again, if you have any ideas, uh, um, you know, speaking to the to the the, the attendees, uh, if you have any ideas on how we can improve LCAT and help it help you um, in your mission, uh, please uh, contact us. Um, so thank you all for your time. Um, once this uh, webinar, which has been recorded, is posted, uh, I will uh, send a follow-up email out to let people know where it is. All right, uh, everybody, have a good day, and thank you again for your time. Thank you, Mike, for organizing. Goodbye, everybody.